the, the claim that you just made, for example, that there is a very large literature supporting the idea of medical transition and a very small literature criticizing it is striking. I don't understand it. What's going on? Like, what's driving this? Why is it that the, the medical associations and the psychological associations have rushed so precipitously into gender identity affirmation when the cost of it, when it's taken to its logical conclusion, is extraordinarily invasive surgical modification, which carries substantive risk and which I think it's of which I think it's fair to say has disputable benefits. What why is this happening? Well, there are a number of reasons it's happening, but if you're asking why um, more medical, you know, more doctors and therapists aren't speaking out, I think the answer is because if even Jordan Peterson is a, is concerned about having this interview with me and with with all of your courage and all the stances you've taken, imagine what far less courageous doctors are willing to say. It still strikes me it's, it still strikes me as as remarkable that this change has occurred over such a short period of time. I mean, one of the things you do in the book, and maybe you can you can talk about this, um, is document the 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 nature of the treatment, the the medical treatment for gender dysphoria when the treatment is gender transition. So you you talk about the use of testosterone and its subsidy on, on university campuses. And then you talk about the more invasive surgical transformations, double mastectomies, phalloplasty, and, and which is the creation of a new penis, um, if you use that word loosely. Um, these are very... These are not minor procedures, including the use of testosterone. And it's remarkable to me, given that, how fast these guidelines for treatment have changed. Well, I, I think you're right. The medical, the, the activists have been very aggressive and very effective here in the medical accrediting institutions. But I think that all of, at root of all of these changes is a series of polite lies that we were um, that we swallowed, unfortunately, in the public sphere. So in the last week, for instance, the California Insurance Commissioner has, has said that for the purposes of insurance in California, that um, breast surgery, top surgery, double mastectomy on healthy breasts for even teenage girls needs to be re regard regarded no longer as cosmetic, but something that corrects abnormal structures because if you've accepted the lie that a, a young woman who says she's a boy truly is a boy, then healthy breasts become abnormal structures. This is the corruption of language. So you must mm -hmm. remove them regardless of her age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, language tends to be associated with action. And it was the corruption of language that I objected to, you know, four years ago because it has consequences. Now, you know, you made the strongest statement so far, I would say, that you made in our interview, which is the lie that an adolescent girl who thinks she is a boy truly is a boy. And I suppose it's language like that that gets you in trouble to the degree that you get into trouble, because that's a pretty strong statement. Um, the gender theorists who are driving this movement, I would say, put forth the proposition that First of all, that an individual always knows what gender they are, even if that changes from day to day. There isn't an authority outside the individual themselves that can opine on gender identity. That's, that's part of the philosophy that, that drives the gender affirmation movement, I would say. Correct? Right. That's part of the philosophy. But unfortunately, there's no biological or empirical or, or means of verifying that. We have no means right. of, say, of establishing that a girl who believes she is a, a boy is truly a boy. In well, fact, it's, a, a it's, of more, it's more of a definition than anything else, right? It's a place to start. It's an axiom. 
The axiom it's is that the only person who can offer an informed opinion about the about their gender is the person themselves. No medical professionals, no parents, no loved ones, no one else, only the individual. And that's even the case if it changes from day to day or hour to hour. Right, exactly. Okay. They begin with a conclusion. Okay, and then th then the other claim, and this is the one that, that I have difficulty with logically, is that a, a girl who thinks she is a boy is in fact a boy trapped in a girl's body, which seems to me, and that that's been the case ever since birth. And it seems to me that this is a form of the biological essentialism that the gender theorists typically decry, proposing as they typically do that gender is a social construct. Now, it isn't obvious to me how gender can be a social construct and be something immutable from birth that's only known to an individual themselves, which sounds a lot more like a biological explanation to me. So... Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I interviewed affirmative therapists and I would say to them and they would say, well, some kids are gender fluid. And I would say to them, well, then how can you recommend, rever you know, top surgery on a young woman who's who may be turn out to be gender fluid, meaning she decides at some point she isn't she was wrong. She isn't a boy. She's a girl. And and, um, you know, this response was essentially, well, only she can know her truth. I mean, we are, we are, we are, this is not medicine any longer. It's closer to witchcraft. So, let me, let me, let me start at the beginning um, and outline the hypothesis of the book. So, over the last five years, there's been a tremendous transformation in the language and the conceptualization that's been applied by medical associations in relationship to gender. And gender has been defined as something that's a personal choice, essentially, and that personal choice has been extended to the, um, to, to the domain of physiological transformation. And medical professionals have been required, are now required, to accede to any requests for physiological transformation on the part of their clients or patients as a consequence of the mandates of their professional organizations. And the consequence of that has been a shift in the transgender phenomenon from a tiny percentage of primarily males to a 1 in 50 percentage of primarily adolescent females, many of whom are undergoing the full physiological or m many of whom are undergoing at least part of the physiological transformation process. That sums it up, essentially, I believe. I'm not sure I totally followed that, but I think so. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I probably should have asked you this at the beginning of the interview, but the basic, sure. I was trying to outline the basic argument that you were making. Right. The basic argument that I'm making is that girls are, uh, is that a, a large population of teenage girls who probably do not have gender dysphoria, they certainly have an atypical form of gender dysphoria, are able to um, quickly obtain hormones and surgeries. They are, they are very much, you know, they're, um, acting under so you know social media influence and peer influence, we have numbers on that. Um, certainly not my studies, but others have done studies on this. Um, and they're acting under the influence of peer influence and social media influence. They are quickly obtaining hormones and surgeries, and there is virtually no over medical oversight of this process. That's the thesis of the book. Right, and so so the alternating hypotheses are either that there's been an explosion in. Um, transgender identifying individuals because the social strictures have been taken off the diagnosis or that this is a form of psychological contagion right i, I don't i don't think it's the former uh, I, I started to explain why i mean yeah. one of the reasons i said as you would expect 
you know, a large, you know, rise in, gen in transgender identification across populations. It wouldn't just be teenage girls. You would see women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. You would see more men, you know, coming out as transgender um, in, in comparable rates. But, but not only that, you're seeing among this population, we, we know that rates of suicide and depression are rising as social acceptance um, of, of gender dysphoria is going, or transgender identification is going up. But, but we would have predicted that those things going down with social acceptance. Instead, it seems to be, you know, coincident and comorbid with teenage girls' mental health crisis, in which we're seeing very, very high rates of um, anxiety and depression. I have to think about, I have to think for a minute here. And I want to go back to why this is happening. So there's been a political, arguably, no, I won't, I won't state, say that. There's been a transformation in the way that transgender identity is conceptualized and treated in the last five years. What's, what's motivating the people who are, who have been behind this transformation? What's in it for them? Well, I think that there are, you know, people who are, there, there are a number of things. There is a strong ideological and, and um, financial commitments and incentives for certain people to insist that, that, that transition on demand, regardless of age, context, or other mental health problems, be always immediately facilitated. And right. Well, it seems like that's it's nece that becomes necessary to prove something. It seems to me, and, and that's what I'm. I know that's what I'm trying to get at is that it's necessary to set up the medical system so that gender dysphoric, transgender identifying teenagers have access to the full arsenal of medical transformation. And that helps demonstrate that some other axiom is true. What what is that? Is that is it the is the axiom that gender is in fact socially constructed? Do, do you see what I mean? Well, I, is that I there's an, the, Why, the, you said there's an ideological prove? reason? I, what I'm well, trying to do is to specify yeah. that reason. I'd like to understand that reason. I, I don't know, know that there is a larger sociological or ideological goal. I think they are ideologically motivated. So in other words, they have these commitments, but I don't think that they're trying to prove something, um, you know, except in, in the way that I suppose that they're, that they are saviors of some kind. Um, you know, look, well, that would be, are, that would certainly be something to, that would be motivating to prove. I mean, if you notice the doctors who are pushing this very often, that we, we, what we, we're certainly seeing in the United States is a young generation of doctors and, and therapists who are activists first and doctors or therapists second. We're seeing this across society um, in, in all kinds of you know, professions. Their, their ideological commitments precede their, their um, professional investigation. They begin with their conclusions. Yeah, well, the ideological commitment is that I, this is what I, I, can't, I can't wrap my head around it because the ideological commitment, if it's that gender is socially malleable or a social construct, which seems to be, like, that seems to be a fundamental axiom that drives this kind of ideology. I can't see how that can live side by side, side by side, the proposition that the girl who's trapped in a boy's body has an immutably male identity. 